And then finally, um, I'd like to welcome our feature, um, who's a very good friend of mine, Russell Hamilton, up to the stage. Yes, round of applause, round of applause. So Russell is a, hello, y'all can hear me. Russell is a Jamaican-American multidisciplinary artist based in Los Angeles by way of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, his creative practice permeates ethnology and sociology throughout the diaspora. Hamilton's commitment is to examine the multiplicity of marginalized demographics, highlighting the nuance and agency within their communities. Photography and filmmaking serve as the vehicle for documentation using the archives as his selected framework. So welcome, Russell. Good evening, good evening. Um, thank y'all for coming out tonight. Um, thank you to the Schomburg for opening its doors, you know, to allow us to hold space. Um, and can we get another round of applause for Dr. Griffin here? She, she been working hard all week. Um, tonight we're going to uh, screen an episode of Fifth Quarter. Fifth Quarter is an archival mini series that I created um, as an homage and exploration into the nuanced world of Black Southern marching band programs, specifically HBCUs and predominantly black high schools. Um, traditionally speaking, like the, the marching band accompanies the football team throughout, throughout its season. And you can find the marching band kind of housed in the stands where for four quarters, they're playing throughout the game, providing entertainment. Um, but there's also like a halftime show, which each band gets about 15 minutes to perform a field show that consists of a drill uh, excuse me, a ballad, a drill, and a dance routine. Um, but the unofficial quarter is known as the fifth quarter, which is after the game where the bands stick around in the stands. And for hours sometimes into the night, they play head to head, song for song. You'll see the crowd, whoever decides to stick around, kind of congregate on the field, on the track. Football players will stick around, alumni, uh, excuse me, alumni. But it's a really like spiritual experience sometimes. Um, just the level of musicianship, because all of this is played off of memory. Um, but tonight we're going to be focusing on fanfares. And fanfares are traditionally played by brass instruments as uh, an arrangement to, as a call and a response to other bands in their respective sections. So a lot of times fanfares could be a rendition of a popular song. And you'll notice like what song they're playing, which is like really exciting. Um, but it also kind of exemplifies the musicianship of that section how cohesive they play, um, as well as the power that they play with, the sonics. So tonight I want you all to focus on the improvisational language of these fanfares in terms of the soloists, how they step forward, and how their sound kind of permeates the rest of the section, the nonverbal communication that, um, that, that occurs in terms of how to move on within a fanfare. Um, but also pay attention to the crowd and like the audience because that's very much so an important part of the experience in terms of the improv and the spontaneity. So like pay attention to the commentary and just like just the overall emotional experience and then pay attention to yourself in terms of how this music makes you feel if you're able to recognize um, some of the music you know that, that they play. Uh, but yeah, so no further delay. Thank y'all again for coming out and this is fifth quarter. All right. Okay, so now we're gonna just have a few questions for um, Russell, and then we'll open up the floor for a little question and answer. Um, so first things first, can you give us a brief history of black marching bands? Um, yeah, so black marching bands kind of came about in you know post-war era, mm -hmm. where you know a lot of the vets would come home and have that kind of experience of doing the more militant drills, mm -hmm. um, but at that time you know, you have kind of like the early days of like jazz and blues, which would kind of permeate that more militant style. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times people credit uh, Dr. William P. Foster, who founded the FAMU Marching 100, uh, for bringing about that style of like high, high leg lifts and marching, um, but also incorporating and fusing that type of like music with the more militant style. Um, but then as music evolves, like, the black marching bands would often play the top 40 songs. 
So that's what would kind of distinguish, you know, black marching bands from, you know, traditionally white bands. Um, and, you know, you got to think about these eras of where the top 40 song is like a Temptations track, you know. So during those field shows and those halftime shows, that's the kind of playlist that would be played in addition to the more technical musical arrangements. But that's kind of like the early days of black marching bands, yeah. Mm -hmm. And just to give some background on the decision behind me reaching out to Russ <laughs> for this film or for this film and for this presentation, um, you know, this program is about unstructured art, right? Art that rejects, art that um, improvises um, towards a political objective. And the way that Russ has always talked about um, black marching bands has illuminated the way that I've thought about militancy and order in that um, these are folks, and you know, it might seem familiar to us, um, but these are folks that have really um, done um, this type of order and unison on their own terms, right? So it's still a rejection of like the state order, like a professionalism, but they do it on their own terms. And I, I just think that's so powerful how there's so much um, also like sub language that you can only understand if you know the culture well, if you're in the stands, if you from that city, if you from that high school. Um, so anyway, before I get, before we get into more of that, I wanna hear a little bit about your own personal uh, history with the marching bands. How did you, why are you doing this? Like how, why did, why did we just watch that really dope um, grainy film, like intentionally grainy, right? right. Because it's an archive yeah. and because you know, you don't, it's not about the details of people's faces, it's about the unison, it's about the rhythm, it's about the sound. So how did you get into this? What's your story behind it? Um, so I'll just give you my whole background in band, like uh, growing up in Atlanta, uh, specifically DeKalb County, um, I came up in a program of Southwest DeKalb High School. Um, and Southwest DeKalb High School, if y'all aren't familiar, I don't know if anybody in here has seen Drumline, the movie Drumline, mm -hmm. yeah, so, um, basically, the band that was featured in that movie was my high school, so they were a high school band performing as a college band. Um, but growing up, you know, you're allowed to get into the band or at least start playing an instrument around fifth grade. Um, so being that that was like a feeder school of ours, you know, a lot of times Southwest DeKalb would come to my elementary school and perform for us like pep rallies to kind of like motivate us for like standardized tests and stuff like that. Um, and like, you know, it was always something that was very prominent amongst that, amongst the county that that was like a go-to school. And like, they just have so many accolades. They performed at the open ceremonies for like the French Olymp Olympics, Atlanta Olympics. Um, they've done the Thanksgiving, uh, Macy's Day Parade, the Pasadena Rose Bowl. So like, it's definitely a high school that was revered for their musicianship and just their overall program. So when Drumline came out, it was just like, you know, it really sent a shockwave through the city in terms of the culture to like, nah, we gotta get in the band. You know, like I have friends who would play, who were playing like football and baseball at a, on a little league level, but they was like, nah, bump that. I'm trying to be in the band now, you know? <laughs> so I think that's kind of like the origin of what got me into it. Um, and then fast forward around like seventh grade, I was able to start actually playing with Southwest DeKalb um, for an event called Jamboree, which was like usually in the springtime as like the last kind of major band event before the, the school year was over. But it was like a really popular event in terms of like, you know, we would, we would host it at the Phillips Arena and it would be sold out, yeah. you know? So basically all of the bands within that county would just, would battle each other. But Southwest Cab would always be like the headline band and it would be exciting to know who's gonna play against Southwest Cab, you know? So around seventh grade, that's when I started in the high school level. And then, or excuse me, let me back up. Like when I got into band, I started playing trumpet. Um, and I wanna say my second year at Southwest, I started playing baritone. And then by junior and senior year, I was a drum major. So I say all that to say like, I'm a certified band nerd, you know? <laughs> so um, in terms of fifth quarter and like the archival footage, you know, it's something that I would always be on YouTube just kind of revisiting these moments. And there's, there's definitely a subculture of people who are literally out there with their cameras recording all of this stuff. So, you know, with that being said, you know, I'd gotten to the point where I wanted to do something creative. Um, but knowing that a lot of this footage is recorded on VHS or cell phones sometimes, 
the, the audio quality isn't that good to just listen to, but so much information is in the visual experience of it, you know, that it has to be an audio-visual experience. So that's kind of why this is the template for it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Okay. Um, can you talk, you kind of mentioned this a little bit, but talk a little bit about how the marching band, you said there were folks on the football team, people playing sports, but when the marching band emerged for real, that became a thing to do. Talk a little bit about how it was um, a, like a refuge, so to speak, a political and social refuge, you know, similar to how, you know, horses might be for, you know, young folks in Compton or, or Jerkin was for kids in like Lamert Park and Crenshaw District. I mean, the, the examples go on and on, but like talk to us about what the marching band meant for kids. Right, um, the marching band was like a space of refuge and something to do, you know, and something to be a part of, a community to be a part of, especially knowing that, you know, Southwest Cab had the reputation that it had. It was, it was a privilege and it was something to be proud of, to be a part. Um, and in the South, like marching band is on par with any other athletic program. So it's just even the, le the level of athleticism is on par. So some of the coolest kids are in the band. So you know you want to you know want you want to be looked up to in that way, um, and you want to be a part of something. And I think that, given the the area, there's not much to do outside of that. So for me, if I didn't have marching band, like I don't know what I'd be on. You know, like in terms of not having a discipline or a passion to do after school, mm -hmm. um, it gives you something to look forward to in terms of just like the social experience, you know, having friends and being able to be accepted amongst the band and amongst the section and something to kind of like, as a way out, you know, a lot of kids go to college right. because of the marching band. Right. The same way that, you know, any other athlete might take their, their sport, exactly, their sport seriously for scholarships. So um, band definitely provides that. Um, and then just the intergenerational legacy where, you know, people's parents might have been in that program. And, you know, it's just like a whole lineage mm -hmm. that exists. So it's kind of like you're groomed into it. And like I said, there, there's feeder schools. So um, on a collegiate level, the feeder school would have been FAMU, which again is like the origin of the black marching band. So there's a lot of like legacy there. And I think that's what the, brand, the band provided for just my community. Um, I'm sorry, I forget the other part of the question. It's okay, but I, I know when I've heard you talk about this, um, you talk about it with so much dignity, and I think that's really important. Um, you know, there's dignity in the uniform. Right. Um, there's dignity in the in the um, the organization, you know, in the clean sounds. There's dignity in the lines, um, the militancy of it, but also in, like, the humor and the language, right. you know, the secret language that yeah. nobody really knows until you're there and I just I just wanted to make the point that like you know overall when we talk you know through this conference about chaos and we talk about improvisation and about um, uh, the illogical the irrational you know the illegibility of things and how that's necessary within political movements um, the black marching band is so special because it's it's um, it's dignity done on people's own terms and better Right. than it could have ever been done, you know? Better than like a state or like a job appointed dignity or some kind of administrative or university appointed dignity. Right. It's, a, it's, an, it's an organic dignity. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I hear, I hear you talk, I, that's, that's what I hear you talking about a lot. Um, okay, this is, uh, I got two more questions for you and then I'm gonna open up the floor, I'm sorry y'all. <laughs> so it kind of feeds into the last thing that we were talking about, but how is this clear cohesion um, and unison radically separate or even a rejection of like a larger social professionalization that's demanded of these musicians? Because, you know, when we think of like that film was a showcase of both improvisation, but also clear order. You know what I'm saying? It had both on the table. Um, but how is that different from like the order that's expected of these kids in school, in college, on the streets? pull your pants up, wear the certain clothes, talk a certain way, et cetera, et cetera. All right, well, I think on, on the surface, you know, it's definitely organized. Um, and like I said, there is a militant component to it. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the beauty in it, which we saw in some of the clips, was the individualism that you also get to express outside of the structure. Mm -hmm. um, so like, I quote my band director a lot of times, he would say, 
there's a time to turn it on and a time to turn it off, right? So in the time when it's turned on, like, just do you, you know what I mean? When we're in the stands and we're celebrating, it's just like, that's really what it's about, is creating that, that fun atmosphere there for the fans and the, and the football team to really motivate them, you know, motivate us to win. Um, but in terms of the time to turn it off, that's when we go back to attention. You know, when you hear that whistle right. um, sound, then that's when it's time to kind of, it's about business now. And I think there's like a level of just the representation that you have, even being in school, people knowing that you're in a band, there's an expectation for you to conduct yourself a certain way. Right. Um, I think like even beyond that, just the idea of, again, the, the lineage that occurs, being able to represent the, the legacy that you're a part of mm -hmm. is very important. Um, and like specifically the clip where we saw the tubas playing Just My Imagination, mm -hmm. You kind of saw, or, or or even the earlier clip where it was FAMU and the trombones and, and just the different band members are having their own kind of like party and dance routines within the stand. Like that's the individualism, you know, um, that you might not really know about unless you're actually there and a part of it. Right. Um, so the silliest person could, could, could flip a switch and be the most militant, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, something else I want to kind of like touch on is in terms of the individualism, when they're performing those fanfares and those, those solos, just the ability to like stretch your instrument beyond its traditional function. Yeah. You know, like that one performance, that trombone yeah. performance, that young man's name was like, uh, I think William Bilal. Yeah. And like he plays his horn like, like almost as if he's singing, you know, he puts his whole body into it um, to where that performance has That's inspired. That's my favorite one. Word. <laughs> Yeah, that performance has inspired so many other trombone sections to try to like replicate that. And a lot of times these fanfares are, you know, written and composed by previous band members that get passed down almost like folklore, if you will. So I think those are the components that are that differentiate it from the more traditional structures of, you know, some of these organizations. For sure. That there is a lot of like freedom in it. For sure. Yeah. Um, final question. So one element of the space of an undercommons, <clears throat> excuse me, is that, and Tommy mentioned this earlier when he asked this question to, uh, <clears throat> oh, I'm losing my voice. <laughs> You've been busy. <laughs> right? Yeah. Improvisation on that ass. Oh, excuse me. Sorry, I'm cursing. <laughs> <clears throat> is that the study proceeds our call to it. Um, so study, you're always in study in preparation for our call to be studied, right? And we'll continue even after we've left the room. So it also falls in line with the study of music, the understanding that the music starts even before the first note is played. Mm -hmm. And it continues after the last, <clears throat> after the last horn is blown. Right. Um, so this kind of goes into the refusal of order, obviously, because order, which is colonial, you know, which is, both beyond the scope of this program, but also very much in this program. Um, order is, is harmful, it's violent, right? It's inorganic, it's, it's unnatural to us. Um, so this goes into the refusal of order, <clears throat> that distinction, the refusal of the distinction between noise and music and the distinction between knowledge and truth. So can you tell us a little bit about the social, and you've touched on this kind of already, but can you kind of pull out a little bit more about the social world of fifth quarter? and the language of not just the musicians, but folks in the stand or even people in the city. Because, you know, to me, it's a, it fall, it's, it's on par with these, um, um, you know, people want to call them dialects, um, but they're really full out languages. They're fugitive languages like Patois or Pidgin English in which you have to be in a know to know to know. You got to be in a know to know, you know? It's not for the state to know. It's not for YouTubers to know. You know, it's for people that it's 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 meant for the people that it's meant for, right. so to speak. So, can you talk a little bit um, about that social life and that and that language, both before um, the first horn blows and after? Right. Well, um, yeah. To that point, I think the overall experience is like it's an ecosystem within itself, to where, you know, there's like a an underground code, if you will, of, of marching band in terms of the legacy, like I said, you know, the lineage that exists. So you you kind of already, you the reputation, you know, precedes you, you know what I mean? So it's like, you already know what you're going to experience because this program is, is notorious for this, right? So 
that's where the excitement comes around in terms of like the rivalries and like which bands are gonna play against each other because of the the history that exists between them, you know? Um, I think like even in terms of the the audience, the engagement, right? As we saw a lot of times, some of the commentary is his own thing to pay attention to, how they respond, because those are people's family members out there in the audience and right. you know, just boosting them. Right. Um, then I think there's just like, just this, the will to do good, you know, to perform well because you have so much to live up to. Um, a lot of times you'll hear, which we, we kind of heard a couple of times in some of those fanfares where like the musicians will completely go against what they're supposed to do and, and play a note at a completely different octave, right? And it's, it's dope if you hit that note properly, right? But if you don't, please believe you're gonna have to do some laps and some push-ups because of that, because <laughs> you're making it look bad, right? Yeah. But I think it's just, it's just the ability to, again, um, express yourself and the individualism amongst that ecosystem yeah. that it is a language within itself to where it's like, if you know, you know. And if you know, then you know how deep the legacy goes for it um, and what you, what to uphold, you know? Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers it. It does. But, yeah. Well, I, I thank you for your investment in this art form. I thank you for sharing it with us in this wonderful, exciting ass film. You know, we're blessed to share it in this historic space um, with you all, for sure. Um, and so now I'd like to open up uh, the audience for any questions that you might have. Um, anyone, anyone? Or any type of like discussion points or any, any quick thoughts, you know? Yeah. Um, so I chose those those clips because, um, again, traditionally speaking, you'll see a, the whole band perform together. So even the very, very last clip when the credits were rolling, that was an entire band playing. But that song, um, I forget the name of the original group, but the song is called SOS. And when FAMU plays that, that's kind of a, you know, a prominent song that everybody knows to kind of prepare to, to battle, you know? So that's like, that's like the band's fanfare as a collective. Um, but I chose these clips because I, I felt like they all kind of highlighted the purpose of the fanfare, like what the fanfare does in terms of like isolating each section by the horn. So if you notice, I went from the trumpet to the trombones, to the euphoniums, to the tubas, right? Um, so pretty much that was like my choice in the selection. And I just felt like those are some of my favorites in terms of the musicianship and like the excitement and energy that I felt like would resonate well on screen. Yo. Wait, Tommy, can you pass me the mic? No, folks, if you have a question, please come up to the mics in the back. There's one here and there's one here. Thank you, Casey. You're welcome. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. That was lovely, by the way. Thank you. Um, there was a moment where um, I noticed it went from uh, um, an image of the entire band, right? Like of many people, and then it goes out of focus. And it goes like in this sort of like the bouquet, the mm -hmm. blur, and then it goes back in. And that part kind of stood out to me because it was a little different than the rest. I was wondering why you chose to include that into the film. Um, well, again, these are all archived videos. Um, so in terms of the cameraman in that moment, he just kind of chose to pan away um, but in his own way, I didn't edit it out because just the, in terms of that portion of the fanfare, like I didn't want to break, break it up. And I just felt like that pan in a way of, of it going to a more blurred kind of moment, um, heightened the emotion around just them singing, um, to when it came back into focus. And I felt like it was important to show the rest of the band outside, because even though that was a tuba fanfare, you saw the rest of the band was engaged in, in the actual song, which is a, a very prominent part of marching band when, where we do chants. Um, so I felt like that clip, I didn't want to edit that out. I wanted to kind of keep it original to the, to the, um, the actual um, cinematographer in that moment. Thank you. No, for sure. 
Any final questions? Oh, I wanted to ask you, why did you choose like brass instrument? Is it brass or like tr tuba, and, tuba and trombone? Yeah, um, brass like, instruments. Those are brass. Okay, how come you didn't like? Uh, you know, I really like the um, dancing mm -hmm. elements of like drum. How come you just focus on like, musical instruments and not like dance or anything? Well, because again, like this episode was about fanfares, and fanfares are traditionally performed by brass instruments. Um, so in other episodes, there are dance components where we see the dancers and the drum majors and the drum line and the entire band, but specifically um, to be in conversation with tonight's program in terms of improvisation, I felt like I wanted to focus on the sections that usually highlight that. Oh, I just wanted to say I thought this was really cool because um, it wasn't you. so much a question, but just a comment because I've been following you for a while. So just to see something like this and just to see like different parts of like black culture throughout America. But like, you know, I grew up in New York City in Harlem. So like we don't have stuff mm -hmm. like this, you know what I mean? Like right. seeing marching bands in this particular way. So seeing this particular culture highlighted throughout the South. And like you said, like it's not just college. Because when I thought of marching bands, I always thought of like, HBCUs, mm -hmm. um, which I've not gone to one, mm -hmm. but so that's what I thought of. So then you said that you started playing the instrument um, at such a young age and that these kids sort of like grow up into this and right. it's not just like a college experience. I thought that was just a really cool thing to share and to show just like black culture throughout the states, but like specific to the South where those of us that are not from the South can see what that's like. So I just thought that was like just a comment. I thought it was mm -hmm. really beautiful and just to see another aspect Thank of you. black life. So yeah. Yeah, appreciate it. Um, to your point, like I don't think a lot of people understand that this is a regional experience that's kind of specific to the South. And I think even for me, like I live in Los Angeles now and it took me, like I always knew that it was special. This was something that was specific to the Southern experience, but I didn't really realize how unique that was in terms of how different marching band is in other regions to like recognize that, you know, just in terms of like interest levels, I don't think I would have been as interested if, it, if, if I didn't, if I wasn't a part of a band program in the South. Um, and then I think like even in terms of the, the ecosystem of that, a lot of people don't know how, how far or how early you're exposed to that culture you know, at such a young age for you to be groomed into that. And again, that's something that's definitely specific to the South. Um, so with Fifth Quarter, again, it was about highlighting like the nuances of that world, which I wanted to kind of like explore a little bit deeper. Um, and just some, you know, more fun facts about the program, like even like a, like an Andre 3000, you know, in the, the Aquimini album, in the booklet, he's wearing the Southwest Decat marching uniform. You know, so like growing up and seeing that type of stuff, it's like, yo, I have to be a part of this program, you know, because it's fly. Um, so yeah, I just kind of wanted to like elaborate on that context a little bit more with this series, so. All right. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Russ. One final round of applause, please. Yeah. Thank y'all. Appreciate it. Thank y'all so much for coming out. Um, I really, I'm really hoping this, this, uh, this series, and specifically tonight, has really inspired folks to honor and um, learn from the disorder, the chaos, the illogical, the unhoused, the things that seem like they're not supposed to be, but really are kind of like the organic, most special parts um, of ourselves, if that makes sense. Um, those are the most dangerous parts. Um, so I thank everybody for coming out. I hope it energized you, you know, I hope you're inspired by it. We're being live streamed right now. <laughs> so, so you could catch this, you know, catch us on YouTube and, um, please support the Sean Burke Center as much as you can if you live out here and have a great night, y'all. Thank you. Peace y'all. Be safe.